I was born in 1958 in a place called Sutton Coalfield, which was a suburb of Birmingham. My parents were both working class West Indians who came here in the mid-50s and met here. They were quite happily proud Jamaicans, but they were really clear, we're in England, if you're going to flourish you need to engage with the people and the culture and the whole emotional thing that's going on. Because I'd done very well at school and my school career had culminated in me being you know, head boy in an all-white school, I thought of the three services and the RAF seemed clean, refined, I wouldn't go as far as to say sophisticated, but bearable. And then when I went and looked at the trades, air traffic control seemed just about right. And there was some apprehension. I mean, I was vaguely aware that the forces were not exactly the, you know, the hotbed of what we'd now call political correctness. So I was braced for, you know, maybe a bumpy start, but it, it just wasn't like that. In the RAF, they were a bit confused because I sounded like this. And there were an awful lot of people who were very happy to invent a backstory that my parents must be diplomats or lawyers or, you know, something very middle class. And I suppose I'd had quite a lot of mild amusement letting people know that Dad drove a van, Mum was a nurse, and it was all very ordinary. In an air traffic control tower, at the very top, you had uh, the air crew who was always on duty with us to give us perspective on anything that was happening. Then you had the commissioned officers who were the senior air traffic controllers. You also had non-commissioned senior officers. Then you had various levels of airmen. There were, there were hierarchies, but there was a surprising degree of equality in the communication. So it was quite, it's quite strange. You knew you were talking to a flight lieutenant or a group captain at times, but they related to you. It was quite a civilised discourse. In air traffic control, I got the distinct impression that it was a good thing to be precise, reliable and, and focused. I think some of my closer friends have said, you know, I was born a pedantic control freak and I'm now, as a freelance photographer, specialising in portraiture, exercising a different kind of control freakery. It would be quite difficult to say whether the RAF has changed or not. I mean, I left in 1978, though I did have a very interesting experience a couple of years ago. Um, I met in a completely normal social setting somebody who turned out to be a, a very young serving member of the Royal Air Force who had been to Afghanistan a couple of times and he was openly gay and it was quite clear that his sexuality was no big deal to him and certainly not to his predominantly straight bunch of football playing beer swilling mates it was just generationally for them it just wasn't a big deal and yet when he talked about the living conditions and work and the bull and still the sense of hierarchy, I realised that in some ways it is still, I guess, what the forces need to be, an efficient, hierarchical, highly structured organisation. Another thing that comes up, quite often I'll go into social settings where I'm with people in their 70s, 80s, 90s who I'm meeting for the first time, and there's definitely a sense of, hmm, how's this going to go? Because there's nothing obvious we have in common. But if I let it be known, or it comes out sometimes from other people, that I have served in, in the military, the British military, suddenly I've got a new identity. And despite the still very evident things that make us very different, they have a completely different listening. So it can be quite handy. As far as I'm aware, and I'm reasonably well read and follow things, the, the, the non-white contribution to the great military efforts and the forces, particularly in the war, seems quite neglected. Now, there, there I, I'm reluctant to be too dogmatic about this because I think it's complicated. There's the fact that it's just not that sexy or current, and most things these days require resources, both human and financial. There is good old-fashioned uh, racism, which is that there's a narrative that goes with war heroes and valiant things done in the name of the British Empire that needs for some people to be very clearly about a bunch of upper-middle-class white people ruling and leading and being fabulous. And there's no place in that for people who don't fit because they're the wrong class, the wrong colour, the wrong sex. So there's that problem. And then how do you make it relevant to today anyway? I mean, because we're in such a tussle about race and identity and belonging anyway, why would it be any different with the forces? 
My friend Stephen Bourne does a lot of work in this area and he's almost like a kind of a one-man campaign to, to change this. After the Air Force I did end up for 15 years being a regular attender at Quaker meetings and it's clear they have the peace testimony and they are not tuned in to what the forces are about. And I, I wasn't, it wasn't that I didn't agree with the peace testimony but it wasn't that big a deal either. I think I'm a bit more pragmatic, you know, when there are dangerous things going on in the world, we need armed forces sometimes to bring the only response that's going to make a difference. So I'm not going to say I'm a pacifist, but I have concerns about military excess and certain political leaders being, in a great tradition, being a bit spendthrift with other people's lives. Much more recently, you know, decades after the RAF, um, I happened to bump into a group uh, of West Indian uh, ex-servicemen who every year would be a, a contingent who would march along Whitehall and do the whole thing on Remembrance Day. Oh, of course my grandfather had served in the British Army in the Second World War and he'd been unusually for a black man, he was a sergeant and all that. And, and so I was just being drawn in and then they were sort of insisting that I would join them on the march. Now as a Quaker who hadn't had anything specific to do with the forces since the 1970s. I felt I'd be a bit of an imposter, but they were very clear that it was really important that people of my generation would continue to have something to do with the remembrance event so that people wouldn't start to forget what little they ever realised about the non-white contribution to the Great War efforts. So on that basis, despite my qualms, I went with them and it was the most extraordinary experience. What kind of reception are a collection of non-white servicemen going to get? And I was waiting for, you know, something quite unpleasant. And it was absolutely the contrary. There's huge cheers going up. And I, I just couldn't, I was emotionally just too much. And in a good way, it was just, well, wow, what's happening, you know? And yeah, and then my grandfather had died long before that. But I, I thought about him and I thought, no, I can see this is important. I should be involved in this.